I started this piece by looking for the right slab. I had an idea of the colors and lines in my head, but choosing the right slab dictates the other design elements for this piece. I went with a beach slab I've had for a number of years because it had some really nice spalting and some inclusions that created some nice swirling motion in the grain. Of course I had to cut it down to fit it in my car, but I only lost about six inches. Once I got it into the shop, I began the milling process. I cut it down with a jigsaw because, believe it or not, I don't keep a circular saw in the school shop. I got my shop made flattening jig all set up and ready to go, and then I ran into a problem. All right, my dudes, real quick, I wanted to show you an adjustment that I just had to make to my slab flattening jig. So let me show you this real quick. So this jig, as you can see, it's not gonna clear. It's gonna tap the top of that. So what I did was I just built a little L bracket right here, and that's gonna raise it up a half inch, which is gonna give me the clearance I need for that. So this is totally detachable. I have one right here, and that's just gonna get screwed on. And then that way I can take it off and add it on as I need. But rather than this part riding on the outside wall like it usually does, I'm gonna have this part ride on the inside wall just like that to register. Once I made some on-the-fly adjustments to my flattening jig, everything was smooth sailing from there on out. Now I'm using a two inch flat bottom router bit, but you can use any flat bottom bit you have in the shop in a pinch. My dudes, I just finished milling up or at least flattening the first part of this slab and look at that grain, we got some crazy spalting over here. We've got some really nice grain movement in and around these knots that I'm excited to play with. I have an idea what I'm gonna do for the knots, but now it's time to flip this over to the other side and keep on keeping on. I continued to remove about an eighth of an inch at a time from the bottom of the slab until it was completely flattened. After using the draw knife to remove any rough material and reshape the bevel, I then cleaned out the cracks in the face using a utility knife to prep them for epoxy. I kind of invented a technique here by trying to seal the cracks with CA glue before pouring the resin. The goal was to prevent the epoxy from seeping through and necessitating three or four pours. And luckily it worked. I only did one pour on the bottom and two on the top. While the resin was curing, I milled up the stock for the turned legs. They were made from a piece of eight quarter walnut and cut to one and a half inch square stock. I waited till the next day when the resin had cured and I scraped away the excess using a utility knife. This is a great method to use if you're in a pinch and you don't have a card scraper. Then I prepped for pouring the top by laying out my materials in order from least important to most. You gotta set your priorities. The only difference in pouring the top was that I used an ink rather than a dye to achieve a bolder color. I'm really happy with the way the color turned out.
Now there's a lot of downtime on this piece because of waiting for resin to cure. So while the top was setting up, I jumped over to the lathe to turn the legs. The top of the leg is going to act as a tenon, which will fit into a mortise on the leg assembly. So it needed to be turned to the exact right dimension. Once the resin on the top had set up, I scraped back the excess with the same utility knife trick, and then it was time to inlay some bow ties. Now I've cut bow ties out of wood in the past, and frankly, I just wanted to do something different, so I went with soapstone instead. Soapstone is a beautiful soft material that can be cut with woodworking tools and polishes up really nicely when it's done. I used double stick tape to adhere the bow ties to the slab and then trace them out with a knife. Once I removed the bow ties, I deepened the knife wall and then came back with a router to remove most of the waste. Once the bulk of the waste was removed with the router, I used a chisel to cut back to my line to create a perfect fit. When the glue on the bow ties had cured, I sanded them flush to the top. Now with a wood tie, I might pair them back with a chisel or plane them down flush, but soapstone is so soft that abrasion was the fastest and easiest method to use. I squared up the ends on the table saw using wedges to support the live edge. I did have a small issue with one side pivoting into the cut, but I padded out the fence with extra blocking to take care of the issue. Once everything got sanded, it was time to color the piece. Now the slab ended up being a little bit lighter in color than I initially intended, so I used an aniline dye to give it a deeper, richer color. I also used a brush to cut in around the bow ties to prevent them from absorbing any of the dye. Once the tint had dried, it was time to apply a seal coat. My friends over at Moss Epoxies were kind enough to send me their deep penetrating epoxy, which does a great job stabilizing and solidifying spongy wood. And given the amount of sap wood on this slab, I was happy to try it out on this piece. I actually added a single drop of the same tint to the epoxy in hopes of creating a toner effect and really deepening the color. And I really liked the results I got. I cut two stretchers out of the same stock as the legs and cut a little bevel on them for visual interest. Now the legs will be tenoned into the stretchers and then I can attach the entire leg assembly to the tabletop rather than four individual legs, which will just make life a little easier. I drilled the mortises freehand using a bevel gauge as a visual guide. This is a trick I learned from an old chair maker. With practice, you can get very accurate, very consistent angled mortises. Then I took the legs over to the bandsaw to cut the kerf in the top for the wedge tenon.
you can't have a wedge tenon without wedges. My favorite way to make those wedges is at the bandsaw. Okay, let's freeze for a second. I may or may not have lost the footage of me actually driving the wedge into the tenon. So let's chat about the process for a sec. All I did to create a wedge to tenon was to cut a kerf in the leg at the bandsaw. Then I drove a wedge into the tenon during glue up. Because the tenon is tapered, the mortise is snug at the bottom, but is slightly oversized at the top. Driving the wedge into the tenon closes that gap and creates a very strong joint called the wedge tenon. All right, let's get back to it. With the leg assembly complete, I pre-drilled some countersink holes to attach the assembly to the top. I gave everything one final sanding to 400 grit, and then it was finally time for assembly and finishing. I attached each leg assembly with eight screws and finished the entire table with a combination of oil, urethane, and wax. I really like this finish because it provides a low luster and a very soft tactile experience. And here she is friends, my beautiful brand new coffee table. And as you can clearly see, I totally have room for it in my apartment. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I needed. A four foot coffee table in my studio apartment. Maybe I should revisit my decision making process. Luckily my schedule just opened up. <laughs>